tonight. Tragic mistake. Israel's Netanyahu faces global condemnation following his remarks on the latest Rafa strikes that rendered dozens dead and many more injured. Marching on. India's farmer protests shrug off the heat wave and keep standing strong, demanding better deals on produce as the election nears close. Shaking ground. Papua New Guinea sees yet more evacuations as thousands are feared trapped alive under the rubble. Rescue efforts continuing to dig through. And saved by straws. Breathing life into coral reefs seem much easier when done through some plastic tubes. Using the bad for the better. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Ava Verna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for taking the time to join us on World News tonight. We have a lot of updates to get through to you on the bulletin this evening and we start off with the unfolding Israel-Palestine conflict. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said that the airstrike that killed dozens of displaced Palestinians in Rafah was a tragic mistake. The White House meanwhile says it's assessing if Israel crossed a red line with its Rafah airstrike. At least 45 people were killed and more than 200 others injured after an Israeli airstrike at a refugee camp in Rafah. In response to the casualties, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called the strike a tragic mistake. In Rafah, we already evacuated about one million non-combatant residents and despite our utmost effort not to harm non-combatants, something unfortunately went tragically wrong. We are investigating the incident and will reach conclusions because this is our policy. Netanyahu added that while every non-combatant that is hurt is a tragedy, for Hamas it's a strategy. According to the Gaza Health Ministry and Palestinian medics, most of the casualties were women and children. Washington has long warned Israel to make sure there are limited civilian casualties in Rafah. But with dozens killed in the recent airstrike, the White House is now assessing whether Israel has crossed the line. U.S. officials speaking to media outlet Axios said that the Biden administration is assessing if the airstrike is a violation of what President Biden called a red line, adding that a humanitarian crisis due to the mass displacement of civilians from Rafah could also constitute a violation. Meanwhile, the EU has decided to resume its mission to directly manage and monitor the Rafah border crossing for the first time in 17 years. Joseph Borrell, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security, announced Monday that an agreement was reached on the revival of the EU border assistance mission at a meeting of foreign ministers of the 27 EU countries held in Brussels. The mission was first organized in 2005 by the EU to be dispatched to border areas mired in conflict to monitor, control and manage the flow of people and goods as a neutral third party. It was dispatched to the Rafa checkpoint, but their activities were temporarily suspended after about two years when Hamas took complete control of the Gaza Strip in June 2007. In response to the deadly airstrike, the UN Security Council has scheduled an emergency meeting in New York. According to sources, the closed-door meeting comes at the request of Algeria, a non-permanent member representing Arab regions. The UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, made reference to horrific images from the attack and said that Israel's actions show there is nowhere safe in Gaza. UN Humanitarian Chief Martin Griffiths called the attack utterly unacceptable and criticized Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's current explanation. Meanwhile, on the humanitarian front, Italy became the latest country to resume funding for the United Nations Palestinian Relief Organization, UNRWA. It made the announcement on a visit to Rome by Palestinian Prime Minister Mohammed Mustafa. Prime Minister Giorgia Maloney told Mustafa that Italy supported efforts towards a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza, the release of Israeli hostages held by Hamas, and improved humanitarian aid for the people of Gaza, her office said in a statement. 
Italy was one of a number of countries to block aid for UNRWA following accusations by Israel that some of the agency's staff were involved in the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel that triggered the Gaza war. The step came a day after judges at the UN's World Court ordered Israel to immediately halt its military assault on the southern Gaza city of Rafah in a landmark emergency ruling in South Africa's case accusing Israel of genocide. Foreign Minister Antonio Tajani announced a 35 million euro or 38 million dollar aid package for the Palestinians, of which 5 million euros would go to UNRWA projects. UNRWA employs 13,000 people in Gaza, running the enclave's schools, its primary health care clinics and other social services, and distributing humanitarian aid. It has set out an action plan to better ensure its impartiality, strengthen internal reviews and improve how its staff are monitored. In recent weeks, several countries have resumed funding the agency, including Austria and Germany. And over in the axis of resistance now, the Houthi militants in Yemen are also taking measures in the Red Sea, as it reported new strikes on multiple vessels, which included U.S. destroyers. Yemen's Iran-backed Houthis announced on Monday that they successfully launched aerial attacks against three ships in the Indian Ocean and the Red Sea, as well as on two U.S. destroyers in the Red Sea. Via televised speech, Houthi's military spokesperson, Yahya Sari, named the attack ships as American Largo Desert in the Indian Ocean, the Israeli ship MSC Michela in the Indian Ocean, and the Minerva Lisa in the Red Sea. Sari did not name the two U.S. destroyers, and none of the ships have confirmed any damage. Sari added the attacks are to support the oppressed Palestinian people until the aggression is stopped and the siege on the Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip is lifted. The Houthis have carried out multiple aerial attacks against international ships in the Red Sea and Indian Ocean region since last November. But back in our region now, as the sweltering heat keeps rising, hundreds of Indian farmers have been camping for over a hundred days now between Punjab and Haryana states to demand better prices for their crops, despite the savage heat waves sweeping swathes of northern India. The farmers have stationed themselves at Shambhu borders since their protests began in mid-February. But living in makeshift homes made out tractor trolleys covered their top building can make temperatures that hit 113 to 115 degrees Fahrenheit feel like 122 degrees Fahrenheit. On the 13th of February, thousands of Punjab farmers launched a Dindi Chalo march, setting out the capital in trucks and tractors loaded with bedding and food. Most farmers and leaders say they have no intention of calling off their protest or going home until demands are met. The farmers' groups are seeking guarantees, backed by law, of most states' support or minimum purchase price for crops. And on updates on the lethal landslides now, thousands of residents in Papua New Guinea were ordered by the government to evacuate from the path of a still active landslide that buried alive an estimated 2,000 people. The government of Papua New Guinea ordered thousands of residents to evacuate on Tuesday over fears of further landslides. Officials say the situation remains unstable following Friday's disaster, with rocks and debris still tumbling down the mountain. They have informed the UN that the landslide in a remote village buried over 2,000 people. Relief teams have been slowly reaching the remote northern Anger region since Friday, but finding more survivors looks increasingly unlikely. Heavy equipment and aid have been delayed due to the remote location, difficult terrain, and tribal unrest, which has forced the military to escort relief convoys. The Anger Province Disaster Committee says a state of emergency has been declared in the area, affecting thousands. Military personnel are manning checkpoints and assisting in relocating residents to evacuation centers. The UN has put the possible death toll at 670, far lower than local estimates. But the varying figures stems from challenges in accurately assessing the population. The last reliable census was in 2000, and the 2022 voter roll doesn't include those under 18. Let's take a short commercial break now. More world news on the other side. Stay tuned. Welcome back. 
It seems the mission of yesterday has ended in failure as North Korea said its attempt to launch a military spy satellite was not successful when a newly developed rocket engine exploded mid-flight. North Korea's latest failed satellite launch Monday was captured in black and white clips shared by South Korea's military. Just hours earlier, Pyongyang had declared plans to conduct a launch by June 4th, potentially giving it a second spy satellite in orbit. Instead, it became North Korea's third failed launch, after two other fiery crashes last year. The launch appeared to come from Dongchang-ri, a northwestern area of the country where North Korea's main space flight center is based. Pyongyang says the failed liftoff was due to problems with a new liquid-fueled rocket motor, but added other possible causes were being investigated. Japan alerted its residents in the south to North Korea's launch. Chief Cabinet Secretary Yoshimasa Hayashi condemned Pyongyang, but said Japan did not try to shoot down the satellite. North Korea successfully placed its first spy satellite in orbit last November after earlier setbacks in May and August. U.S. space experts say North Korea's satellite, dubbed the Mali Gyong-1, was, quote, alive after detecting changes in its orbit, which suggest Pyongyang was successfully controlling the spacecraft, although its capabilities remain unknown. North Korean state media reported that the satellite had transmitted photos of the Pentagon and White House, among other areas, but has not released any of the images. Pyongyang's latest launch also came hours after a rare three-way summit between South Korea, Japan and China in Seoul, where the countries reaffirmed a common interest in North Korea's denuclearization. On some unprecedented diplomatic updates now, the Uzbek president said at a meeting with visiting Russian President Vladimir Putin that Russia will build a small nuclear power plant in Uzbekistan, the first such project in post-Soviet Central Asia. For more on this story, we have other than the world with special correspondent Minoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. What's the latest, Minoli? Yes, Sanuradi. The nuclear deal, if implemented, will showcase Russia's ability to export not only energy but also high-tech products to new Asian markets at a time when the West is increasing pressure on it through sanctions. Putin said Russia would put $400 million into a joint investment fund of $500 million to finance projects in Uzbekistan. Mirzi Oyev also said Tanshkent was interested in buying more oil and gas from Russia, a reversal of decades long practice where Moscow imported hydrocarbons from Central Asia. According to documents published by the Kremlin, Russian state nuclear firm Rosato will build up to six nuclear reactors with a capacity of 55 megawatts, each in Uzbekistan, a much smaller scale project than the 2.4 gigawatts one agreed in 2018, which remains to be finalized. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you very much. That was other than a world news special correspondent Menoli Zagaria from Kursk in Russia. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky was welcomed by Spain's Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez in Madrid. Spain has pledged to provide military equipment to Ukraine worth 1 billion euros this year under a bilateral agreement signed just a few hours ago. Spain has announced unprecedented military aid to Ukraine during the visit of Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky to Madrid. The bilateral security agreement means Madrid will provide more weapons to Kyiv for an amount of 1.1 billion euros. It includes a supply of new Patriot missiles and Leopard tanks and involves multi-million dollar contracts for the Spanish defense industry. The Spanish Prime Minister also reaffirmed that Spain recognizes the Palestinian state. Vladimir Zelensky supported a two-state solution also. After this meeting, Zelensky was received by Philippe VI at Riel Palace, where he attended a lunch offered by the King and Queen in his honour and visited the Congress of Deputies. King Philippe said he will continue to support Ukraine in the future until the Russian attack ceases, which he condemned in the strongest terms. The Ukrainian leader was due to visit Spain earlier this month, but was forced to postpone his visits abroad following the Russian offensive in the Kharkiv region. He'll next visit Portugal. And on the road to the White House tonight, 
Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s short-lived attempt to become the Libertarian nominee for president flamed out even faster than it started, as he received support from a paltry 19 delegates or 2.07% at the party's D.C. convention, sending him home in the first round. Meanwhile, Trump prepares for a curtain call at the hush money trials with the closing arguments scheduled for later today. Biden, on the other hand, is pushing forward with his Memorial Day-themed agendas for voter support. Tonight, Donald Trump's lawyers are preparing for the final stretch of his hush money criminal trial in New York. Closing arguments set for tomorrow. Some bystanders waiting in line for courtroom seats since Saturday. The unprecedented legal showdown coming after a busy weekend for the former president. On Sunday, he flew over the Charlotte Motor Speedway in Battleground, North Carolina, where NASCAR fans gave him a warm reception. Unlike the Libertarian National Political Convention on Saturday, where Mr. Trump was repeatedly booed. Whoa! That's nice. That's nice. Only if you want to win. Only if you want to win. Maybe you don't want to win. Today, the former president lashed out on social media against his legal troubles. Happy Memorial Day to all, including the human scum that is working so hard to destroy our once great country. While at Arlington National Cemetery, President Biden emphasized what has become a central theme of his campaign, defending democracy. Our democracy is more than just a system of government. It's the very soul of America. Meanwhile, the Biden campaign is trying out a more aggressive strategy to define Mr. Trump following his trial, including a new ad voiced by actor Robert De Niro. To be a dictator to terminate the Constitution. Pope Francis reportedly used a highly derogatory term towards the LGBT community in a recent closed-door meeting with Italian bishops where he reiterated that gay people should not be allowed to become priests. Italy's two largest daily papers both quoted the pontiff as saying seminaries or priesthood colleges are already too full of frocciagine, a vulgar Italian term roughly translating as faggotness. The Vatican did not respond to a request for comment. The alleged incident is said to have happened on May 20th. One outlet suggested the Pope, as an Argentine, might not have realized that the Italian term he used was offensive. The 87-year-old has so far been credited with leading the Roman Catholic Church into taking a more welcoming approach towards the LGBT community. His move last year to allow priests to bless members of same-sex couples triggered substantial conservative backlash. Nevertheless, the Pope's recent alleged comments on gay seminarians, slur excluded, echo a similar message he delivered in 2018, where he told bishops to carefully vet priesthood applicants and reject any suspected homosexuals. In a 2005 document released under Francis's late predecessor Benedict XVI, the Vatican said the Church could admit into the priesthood those who had clearly overcome homosexual tendencies for at least three years. The document said practicing homosexuals and those with, quote, deep-seated gay tendencies and those who, quote, support the so-called gay culture should be barred. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news right after this. Welcome back. When we think of plastic in the environment, we often get a negative connotation. And such is the case most times with pollution running rampant currently. But what if we could use this unfavorable situation for the better? Well, it seems straws are not only for drinking now, but also for saving the corals of the deep sea. Drinking straws have gotten a bad rap in recent years for their impact on the environment. But one company, trying to make a more environmentally friendly straw, created something really helpful. We were working awfully hard to just create a much better product for the world, but we had no idea it was going to be used to save baby coral in the ocean. Biodegradable straws produced by Windcup are being used by Reef Fortify to create coral forts, which protect lab-grown coral reefs from getting eaten up by sea animals. The company tells CBS News, 
It degrades in the marine environment in exactly the target time it takes for the parrotfish to lose interest in the transplanted coral. Divers can go down and clear a spot for the little fort and they adhere it to the reef. But this is really the first biodegradable option that's um, uh, emerged. The straw forts are made from fermented canola oil. And a year later, divers say there's no trace of the temporary structures. But what is left behind is thriving coral. We've more than doubled the survivorship of our transplants out onto the ocean to above 90%. But if we could employ this tactic in other areas of environmental conservation, it will be safe to say that we'll be on track to saving planet Earth. Well, that's all the stories we have to report to you tonight on World News. Tune in again tomorrow for more key updates from across the globe. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.